Good evening, everyone. Hey, everyone back there. We see you in the middle on the throne, too. That's awesome. <laughs> good, good evening. You remember me from yesterday, Melina Hale, your dean of the college. I am delighted to welcome you to the pivotal event of orientation at the University of Chicago, the Aims of Education Address. Before we get underway, I'd like to say a few words about this particular tradition, why it so expresses the spirit of the college and the role that it plays in our approach to liberal education. I am not a historian of the university, but I have it on very good authority that the incoming class and transfer students of the college have gathered in this way, in this venue, at this approximate time, to hear the aims of education address every year since the early 1960s. Our purpose is to hear an eminent scholar on the faculty, invited by the dean of the college, reflect on a theme so lofty and important as to sound audacious. An event like this captures much that is characteristic about the University of Chicago, and we hear regularly from alumni of past generations on their memories of the aims of education addresses long ago. Not only the speaker and the themes, but turns of phrase and stories drawn from the speaker's field of study. There's a good reason why they make such an impression. They ask us to consider the foundational purpose of your studies, from the first encounter with texts in the core to the selection of a major and your thoughts about a professional track. And so it is fitting that the AIMS addresses have become part of the identity of the college, closely connected to our curriculum and some of our key historical figures. One of these is Robert Maynard Hutchins, who served as president of the University of Chicago from 1929 until 1951, and had a lot to do with our approach to liberal education and free expression. The college has published two volumes of Aims of Education addresses in Hutchins' honor, supported by generous alumni who wanted to acknowledge his formative role. What we do this evening honors that memory, but it also celebrates some of the key features of the University of Chicago that bind us across time. When it comes to specific contents of any AIMS address, you should know that the invited speaker begins only with the impossibly broad essay prompt to reflect on the purpose and aims of liberal education and the value that it holds in our lives. Apart from that, the speaker is free to direct the talk in whatever way their reflections and inspirations carry them. You can imagine that crafting this address in a way that does justice to the problem is quite the challenge and requires the skills not only of an accomplished scholar, but also of an inspiring teacher. Our distinguished speaker this evening more than lives up to this description, and I'll venture to say that we would all learn a lot about the aims and the means of liberal education by reviewing his activities at the university. Christopher Wilde is professor in the Department of Germanic Studies, the Committee on Theater and Performance Studies, and the college. He is known for his trenchant scholarship in two areas. One is the influence of religious thought and practice in domains that are usually thought to be both modern and secular, particularly in the Age of Enlightenment. The other is the area of study of European and German theater as a form of media. He is the author of an influential first book on German classical theater and the editor of two volumes and has another much anticipated book coming out soon. Prior to coming to the University of Chicago in 2008, he taught at UNC Chapel Hill, the University of Constance, and at UCLA. Among his colleagues, Professor Wilde is also known as a skilled and imaginative leader in undergraduate education, whose work has contributed much to the experience of our students. He served two terms as master in the Humanities Collegiate Division, during which time he guided a major innovation in the way that we teach and assess language learning. He supported new curricular opportunities like cognitive, the cognitive science major and the program of signature courses. Perhaps most relevant for today, Chris was one of the leading voices in the launch of the Parasia program for public discourse in 2017. Parasia had the path-breaking ambition not just to explore or advocate for free expression, 
but also the more practical goal of training students to engage productively with disagreement. Chris is now the faculty director of Parasia, where he teaches sought-after courses on fearless speech and oversees an exciting profile of events, workshops, classes for educators, high school students, and college students. Finally, if Professor Wilde is a resourceful and creative supporter of the curriculum behind the scenes, he is also a superb teacher who uses a variety of modes to bring out the best in students, from first year courses in the humanities core to seminars for graduate students. His students routinely speak to the clarity and rigor of discussions and courses, a highly engaged style of lecture and questioning, and original assignments for research and writing, often using, ar using archival sources. These turn even large classes into sites for genuine learning and expression. As one student wrote, Professor Wilde's erudition and deep original thinking allows him to promote vivid discussions that contribute to everyone's understanding of the texts. Teaching of this kind brings us to the best and most important mission of the university. It is the kind that inculcates a deep respect of learning, inquiry, and posing questions about the world at hand. It empowers students to engage bravely with the challenges of a complex and uncertain world. So I am very honored to introduce my distinguished colleague, Chris Wilde, who will deliver the 2023 address on the aims of education. Thank you. It's probably going to be the first time that I stand up, or it's the first time I stand up here and probably the last time. You don't get to stand up here very often. Thank you, Dean Hale. Welcome, students. Class. Uh, welcome, class of 2027, to the college at the University of Chicago. I'm honored and truly thrilled to have the privilege of being part of the welcoming party. I'm so glad you're all here. It's the beginning of another academic year, and it may be fall, but it feels like spring to me. A time of renewal and new beginnings. I can feel how excited you are to be here, to finally be in college. The excitement here in Rockefeller Chapel is palpable. I have a good sense how you feel. I remember so well my own excitement when I arrived at college about the endless possibilities, about the many paths beckoning, about the wide open future, a future yet to be made. And I know that for many of you that excitement is mixed with anxiety. Anxiety about whether you're going to make friends, anxiety about whether you're going to find your place and fit in, anxiety whether you're smart enough and going to cut it here. At least about this last thing, I can assure you not to worry. Our admissions office knows what they're doing and you all belong here. And we're all excited that you have come, so welcome. No matter what other things you're worried about, you're probably not as anxious right now as I am. I've confessed that this is a really, really, really big deal. And I'm really nervous. So you're going to ask why. I'm used to speaking in front of students when I teach after all. I'm used to giving talks and lectures at scholarly conferences. That is certainly true, but this is different. For one, there's the size. Uh, there's the, si the size of the audience is intimidating. So is this august place, Rockefeller Chapel. Then the topic which I'm charged to speak, the aims of education. How can I do justice to an issue of this magnitude? How could I possibly speak to the aims and aspirations that a college class of such dizzying diversity of lived experiences, backgrounds, languages, cultures, and nationalities have for their education? Last but not least, I'm nervous because if I succeed today in what I'm going to say, you're not going to listen to me. You're going to examine it, question it, and make up your own mind. I could have turned the invitation down, and more than once in the past weeks and months, I kicked myself for agreeing to do it. But then I reminded myself that I cannot talk to you about liberal education without showing some measure of intellectual courage myself 
without stepping up and talking about what I believe in and to which I have de dedicated much of my adult life. So let me tell, me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about any kind or all kinds of education, not about school education, not about vocational or professional education, not about graduate education. Instead, I'm going to talk about liberal education. And I'm probably not going to talk about its aims in the way you might expect. Instead, I'm going to talk about the liberal in liberal education, about academic freedom and intellectual courage. This annual right at the University of Chicago takes its title from an address from the famous philosopher Alfred North Whitehead um, that he gave to the Mathematical Association of England in 1916. An address given in the tradition and spirit of Whitehead could do worse than begin to, by returning to Plato. For it was Whitehead who quipped that the European philosophical tradition consists in a series of footnotes to Plato. So let me begin with one of the oldest, maybe the oldest, fable of education. It has the added virtue that some of you may already know it. And if you don't, most of you will get to know it as you move through the humanities and social sciences core. In fact, 270 who are taking of you who are taking media aesthetics will discuss it next week. And the almost 300 of you taking philosophical perspectives will read it in about five weeks. And another 250 or so who are going to choose classics of political and social thought will read it next fall. As, and there will be many other classes where you're going to read the text that I'm going to talk about. And I'm talking about the allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic. Socrates introduces this fable or image. It's really hard to classify to illustrate our nature in uh, our nature in its education and want of education. The Greek term is paideia, from which the words like pedagogy and pedagogical are derived. In this fable, human beings are imprisoned since childhood in an underground cave where they're immobilized in such a way that they face the cave wall, which is all they can see. They're thus unable to turn around and see the fire that is burning beyond the cave entrance. They're similarly incapable of seeing the mechanism and the sources of the shadow images that are projected onto the cave wall by the artifacts that are being carried between the entrance and the fire. All they know of the world are these shadows, and because of their bondage, their idea of knowledge consists in naming and ordering the shadow images appearing to them. The true philosophical education begins when one person is released from their bonds and stands up and turns around, exits the cave, but holds the source of images, and then proceeds to leave the underworld and search for the source of all light, namely the sun. Of course, because that person is used to dim light and shadows, their eyes are blinded and hurt by directly beholding first the fire and then the sun. Thus, they have to, the urge to turn back to Borwood what they thought to be true and real all their life. For that reason, they have to be dragged, by whom we're not told, by force along the rough, steep path, until they come to the light of the sun, which blinds them even more. Once they have escaped this, the darkness, they have to adjust to the light in order to, first, to see first the upper world and then the sun itself. Once they learn to look at the sun and recognize the real world reve revealed by its light, they remember the prior life in darkness as well as their fellow cave dwellers. Socrates' pedagogical fable ends with the enlightened cave dwellers returning below in order to tell about their discovery and the predictable response by their former cave mates. In the best scenario, they're greeted with ridicule, and worst case, they encounter hatred and aggression. For what the first ascenders has to say puts into question everything the cave dwellers know and believe. Socrates concludes this little fable by noting that education is not putting into the soul knowledge that isn't in it, but by turning the soul toward light and truth. It is for this reason that he defines the philosophical education he has in mind as an art of turning around. 
The allegory of the cave is a good place to start thinking about liberal education since Athens via Rome is the cradle of liberal arts education in the West. So how does Socrates conceive of education? Well, first of all, he dispels what one could call flippantly the container theory of education. The soul isn't a passive vessel that is in need of being filled with information or knowledge. Rather, Socrates thinks of the soul as an active agent that does something. In this pedagogical fable, it sees the shadows on the wall, the light of the fire, uh, and then the things themselves, and finally, of course, the sun. Given that this is an allegory, we have to take seeing metaphorically. In fact, Pl Plato inaugurates a tradition that conceives of thinking as a kind of seeing of the mind's eye. Thus, education is not so much about what it, what gives, the students to, what it gives the students to see, but changing how they see, making them see in a new way, and allowing them in the end to see things they were unable uh, to behold hitherto. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Here at the University of Chicago, we provi provide ourselves that we do not tell students what to think, but we teach them how to think. The crux of liberal education at a place um, like this is not which major you choose, the disciplinary knowledge you acquire, but the intellectual virtues, the habits of mind, and the practices of deliberation, listening, and debate you develop. Most of the majors we offer are no different from other institutions, but what you can learn here is a distinctive style of thinking. And more generally, you have the opportunity to cultivate what we call a life of the mind. Thus, most of my colleagues would agree that it is not important which major you choose, but you're open to have your thinking transformed. In fact, Socrates felt education to be so transformative that he defined it as an art of turning around, or to put it in a more familiar idiom, a conversion. After all, conversion is, as the Latin root reminds us, literally a turning around. Now you might ask, isn't conversion um, a religious phenomenon? Isn't conversion like the one Paul experienced on the road to Damascus, in a way the opposite of a literal education that tra transforms students into independent thinkers? Doesn't conversion put someone under the spell of a religious creed and its dogmas? Well, it turns out that conversion was a philosophical phenomenon and concept before it was adopted by early Christianity and then later applied to other religions. In ancient philosophy, it referred first and foremost to the profound transformation of the self brought about through philosophical thought and practice. Pivotal to that transformation was the kind of turn towards oneself that Socrates made when he heeded the injunction of the Delphic Oracle to know thyself, began to examine his life as well as that of others. Philosophical education was conversive because it involved letting yourself be transformed, making the knowledge and skills you learn your own, putting what one believes to be true and right into practice. Ancient philosophy was thus less about the examination of abstract questions than a life based on self-reflection and transformation, truth-seeking and telling, and care for others. Thus, getting a liberal education is not only about acquiring and expanding your knowledge and skills, but just as important about coming to an understanding who you are, who you want to be, and who you wanna, what you want to do with your life. The next point about Socrates' pedagogical fable brings me to the gist of this ad address. Note that the first thing that needs to, ha uh, needs to happen so that the first ascender can turn away from the wall, get up and walk toward the source of shadows and light, and then eventually make the long and arduous journey to surface and sun, is that they get freed of the bonds that shackle them to their seat. Education and enlightenment begin not only with an act of liberation, but depend every step of the way on the freedom to seek truth. It's no coincidence that liberal education has its root in ancient Athens and a few other Greek city-states that had democratic governance. To become a competent citizen within a self-ruled community 
needed a specific set of skills, capacities and values that a new kind of education was designed to provide, including the ability to exercise independent and self-reflexive thought, the development of critical informed judgment, and the skill to speak truthfully and effectively in the assembly. In short, ancient democracies depended on independently minded citizens who freely exercised their judgment and choice and unfettered by authority. The Roman Republic inherited this association between education and liberty, and it was the famous orator Cicero who coined the term artes liberales or liberal arts using the word liberal in its original Latin sense of pertaining to free persons. His, auth his authority ensured the survival of liberal education in the Middle Ages, where it became organized systematically as the seven, so-called seven liberal arts, the trivium, rhetoric, grammar, and logic, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. While the term liberty does not come to mind when thinking of the medieval cities and states that supported universities, the link between education and freedom held since its members, both faculty and students, held special rights that other townspeople and citizens lacked. 2,000 years after its emergence, Frederick Douglass still saw the same connection. When his master angrily remarked about his ability to read that it will forever make him unfit as a slave, he recognized education as the direct pathway from slavery to freedom, as he later recalled. Around the same time across the Atlantic, the link between education and liberty was crucial for the emergence of the modern research university in German lands. When Wilhelm von Humboldt, the brother of the famous naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, was tasked with drafting plans for a new kind of university in Berlin, he made academic freedom the foundation of its missions of cultivating, as he said, knowledge and science in the deepest and broadest sense. What was so novel about the university Humboldt designed was that intellectual inquiry and the production of knowledge became its all-defining rationale and purpose. Unlike lower schools, or for that matter, medieval universities, which have as their purpose imparting to students settled bodies of knowledge, this new type of university aimed to, to produce new knowledge. Research and inquiry have as their aim the discovery of truth, and thus knowledge production should not be determined by considerations, factors, and aims, a, external and alien to the process. Put simply, researchers and scholars go where inquiry leads them and truth is pursued for its own sake. Humboldt's idea of pure science and scholarship can only be realized by insisting on what he calls the twin principles of complete freedom and autonomy. History proved Humboldt right. His model of the modern research university was pivotal for the emergence of modern sciences and letters as it produced what a historian called its mandarins, such as physicists like Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, and many others, chemists such as Robert Bunsen, Justus von Liebig, physicians like Robert Virchow and Robert Koch, sociologists like Max Weber, and philosophers like Hegel and even Nietzsche, to name only a few. So when a group of young and ambitious scholars and scientists set out to establish a new university in the Midwest that was to be unlike the elite colleges of the East Coast that had been founded in the Anglo on the Anglo-Saxon model, they not surprisingly looked to the model of the Humboldt University. And today, the University of Chicago is one of the model's purest incarnations in the world. Now, many of you will say, what does this concept of academic freedom have to do with me? Isn't academic freedom for privileged professors like me? Doesn't it pertain to things like tenure that gives them unparalleled job security? Or their right to express their opinions freely, whether in the classroom or beyond the walls of the ivory tower? In other words, Academic freedom is what walls and protects the faculty from the real world. It's the ivory that makes the ivory tower. Of course, there is some truth to this. But as in any caricature, it's only part of the story. 
Humboldt encapsulated his notion of academic freedom in the twin terms of Lea und Lernfreiheit, the liberty to teach and learn. The point that I want to stress here is that academic freedom is just as much about the freedom to learn. It applies to students as much as to teachers. Only if the freedom of inquiry applies to both can they unite in fulfilling the university's mission of unending knowledge production. In fact, Humboldt sees the relation between teacher and student as a symbiotic one and teaching learning as equally essential to research, which is really the gist of the research university as we understand it. Teaching should not only flow directly from the professor's research, but enable it in the first place. Unfettered freedom of inquiry affords a dynamic in which teacher and students join and work together in the production of knowledge. So academic freedom belongs as much to students as it does to teachers. It is the freedom to shape your education, to shape yourselves through their education, and to become the kind of thinker, knower, and citizen, and human being they aspire to be. Let me return again to the allegory of the cave. But because we passed over a little textual detail that throws a wrinkle into everything I said about the link about education and liberty. One of the things about this pedagogical fable that has always puzzled me is that Socrates stays silent on who's doing the liberating. In other words, who liberates the first ascender and liberator? An obvious hypothesis would be that Socrates imagined himself in that role. But that just shifts the problem to the question who liberated in turn Socrates. And then we would have to ask who liberated and turned Socrates liberator, and so on. I think you get the idea. This is what philosophers call an infinite regress. Let me rephrase the problem, uh, the problem at work here. How can education be free if it depends on someone or something else external for its liberation? Another great theorist of education, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, also identify the reliance on the guidance of others as the main obstacle to true education. As a consequence, he conceived his notion of enlightenment in a way that addresses and evades Socrates' dilemma. In his 1784 essay, What is Enlightenment?, which was his submission to an essay contest held by the journal Berlin Monthly, he famously defines enlightenment as, and I quote, the human being's emergence from their self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to make use of one's understanding without another's guidance. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in a lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage, to use one's own mind without another's guidance. Sapere aude, have the courage to make use of your understanding, is therefore the motto of the Enlightenment, Kant concludes. What he foregrounds is that the bondage obstructing education and enlightenment is as much self-imposed as it is external. Others may be restricting our intellectual freedom, but only because we let them. In the fact that we do not think for ourselves has less to do with a lack of ability or opportunity and more with laziness and cowardice, according to Kant you will have immediately picked up on the inherent self-contradiction of this motto, sapere aude, which can be translated as dare to know or have the audacity to think and understand for yourself. Does it really resolve the paradox at the heart of liberal education? If we're supposed to think for ourselves and not follow the guidance of others, why would Kant tell us what to do? Wouldn't we have to ignore it by virtue of following his advice? Or inversely, wouldn't we be be violating his imperative by heeding it? I doubt a philosopher of Kant's caliber was not aware of this internal contradiction. One way to resolve the contradiction would be to think of the sapere aude as a provocation. Kant's wa Kant wants us to resist it and thereby be prompted to start thinking for ourselves. In other words, he would be following, we would be following it by disregarding it. Another way to address the dilemma is to make it an issue of how we put it into practice. Thereby, the problem is not so much with the guidance as such, or who gives it, but how we adopt it. We can follow another person's advice, 
as long as we do not accept it blindly, but make it our own. As long as we think it through our, for ourselves and recognize its truth and validity in the process. And if we do that, we would be both heeding Kant's exhortation and making it obsolete at the same time. Sapere aude, intellectual courage is at the heart of liberal education. In fact, learning to think for yourself it was, is what puts the liberal in liberal education, accounts for the freedom in the notion of academic freedom. It is thus not some abstract concept that belongs to faceless institutions, to their leaders, or to the faculty as some corporate entity. It is an intellectual virtue and civic practice that belongs to each and every member of a university's intellectual community. It comes with responsibility, namely the duty to exercise it in everything you think and do as a student in shaping yourself. And it requires intellectual and moral courage because thinking and learning independently comes with considerable risk. Which brings me back to the allegory of the cave one final time. The danger facing the first ascender comes not only from the perilous ascent, the blinding, it's, and all the other things, but also from his fellow cave mates upon his return. The first ascender has beheld the truth and wants to share their enlightenment with their family, friends, neighbors, and community. But they want to hear none of it. They cling to their dearly held views and resist having it questioned. To the point that the ascender must fear for their life. As Socrates found out for himself, truth-telling uh, truth can be risky, even deadly business. Athenians had a name for such truth-telling. In ancient Athens, every citizen had the right to speak before the assembly. That right was called isagoria, but Athenians also recognized that speaking before the assembly was not without risk and required courage. Thus, they also had a term for availing oneself of the right to speak and stepping up to tell the truth to an audience who might not want to hear it. And that term was parisia, and the person who speaks freely and fearlessly in order to tell the truth they believe in, the truth teller was called a parasiastes. Esigoria is the right, but parasia is the practice to speak freely. And the way the term was understood made clear that the Greeks recognized that speaking in freely, freely and truthfully could be difficult and potentially perilous because truth could upset or anger the listener. The courage to speak the truth freely, to deliberate in dialogue fearlessly with and before others is an essential dimension of the intellectual courage of the heart, at the heart of academic freedom. Parisia is the twin of Kant's sapere aude in Socrates' Know Thyself. Without vigorous deliberation and dialogue, an intellectual community devoted to the pursuit of truth and the production of knowledge cannot function and flourish. Thus, all its members are called upon to listen and understand, interrogate and test, deliberate and debate ideas, thoughts, theories, and views that are generated through research, inquiry, and learning. All that makes intuitive sense. But the distinction between isagoria and parisia recognizes that there is a difference, even a gulf between an abstract right and a concrete practice. That the former is an indispensable precondition that remains incomplete without its enactment. An enactment that requires courage, skill, and frequent practice, which the Athenians captured with that term parisia. Given Chicago's Humboldtian legacy, free inquiry and open discourse have been a keystone of the university's academic culture from the very beginning. Its first president, William Rainey Harper, installed what he called the principle of complete freedom of speech on all subjects as one of the foundations of the university. And his successors have regularly renewed this principle until today. Less than a decade ago, the university's late president, Robert Zimmer, appointed a faculty committee to reaffirm our commitment to free and robust, uninhibited de debate and deliberation among all the members of the university's community. The committee's report quickly became known as the Chicago Principles, and I hope you had a chance to read um, it in advance of today's address. The Chicago Principles are our version of the Athenian Isagoria. They guarantee academic freedom across the university, giving everyone license to speak freely in the pursuit of truth and knowledge. 
They're invaluable and indispensable for everything we do, for research and scholarship, as well as teaching and mentoring, and the many other functions of the university. But they remain abstract and lifeless and with little impact on the university's intellectual life if they're not put into practice. In fact, dozens of universities and colleges have adopted the Chicago principles, often almost word for word, and in many cases, arguably, without palpable effect on their academic culture. Thus, they too require the principles require Parisia to come alive, to be practiced by every member of our intellectual community, whether it is in the classroom, on the quad, in the residence halls, or in the myriad other spaces and venues, real and virtual, that make up the university. What better way there is there to practice Parisia and to heed Kant's sapere aude than by pausing for a moment and refraining from blindly following the Chicago principles? What better way to put the Chicago principles into practice than by examining and debating them? So let me close, close by getting such a critical examination started. An examination that I invite you to continue with your peers in the breakout discussions following this address. As a literature professor, I always begin by, uh, with looking at the title, which in this case is not Chicago principles, but report of the Committee on Freedom of Expression. The focus on free expression is echoed by the already quoted proclamation by William Rainey Harper in the first paragraph and then appears throughout. But let me ask whether freedom of expression in an academic context is really complete and absolute. Is freedom of expression really the highest principle within a university like ours? And I'm not thinking here of the limitations to free expression that the report contemplates such as the restriction of illegal speech, defamation, genuine threats and harassment, the substantial violation of privacy and confidentiality, and speech that is incompatible with the functioning of the university. Rather, I imagine many quotidian spaces and situations in which you and I simply cannot just utter anything without constraints and consequences. Take the classroom, for example. If you're a student in one of my sections of Greece and Rome, you, you say, um, and you say something that has nothing to do with our class discussion or doesn't pertain to the subject of the course, I'll politely point that out. But if you do it again and again, it will have consequences. For instance, on your participation grade. But even if, you say, if what you say is germane to the topic we're discussing but lacks textual support, and you insist on it despite the contrary evidence provided by your classmates or me, it will affect your participation grade. That applies to me as the instructor too. If I spend all my class time telling my students about my latest vacations or talking about party politics, my students will note that in my evaluation and may even complain to the college. And at some point, my department chair and my dean will remind me of my duties. The same goes for a faculty member who gives an academic talk, lecture or talk. The mission of a research university is to advance knowledge beyond the boundaries of established consensus through open intellectual exchange. This involves the testing of old ideas as well as the open-ended exploration of entirely new ones based on verifiable evidence. Similarly, students are not only taught the settled knowledge of a given discipline, but ideally how the process of extending that knowledge works. Now the point of this process is to advance knowledge, not just discuss whatever comes to mind. It is true that scholars and scientists regularly question the assumptions of a discipline, at times returning to seem seemingly obsolete views, but consistently doubting and challenging settled knowledge will at some point exclude one from the community of scholars and scientists. To put it simply, once the validity of facts and views has been established through a long and laborious process of testing, they're no longer subject to unfettered debate in an academic context. Unless, of course, new evidence presents itself. So statements that obstruct and don't further pursuit of truth and the production of knowledge are not strictly illegal, but are sanctioned by the academic community in a variety of ways. 
Robert Hutchins, one of the university's great presidents that was already just now mentioned, is thus correct that in theory our students, as well as the faculty, should have the freedom to discuss any problem that presents itself, but in practice classroom communication and scientific discourse follows rules and procedures somewhat different from those of public debate. That's why the term academic freedom seems more apt and we put the inquiry before expression in the university's new forum for free inquiry and expression that will be officially launched in a little over two weeks. Having said that, there are many spaces and situations in the university that are not directly tied to inquiry and the production of knowledge. The dorms and dining rooms, for example. And what about the quads, hallways, and the many other spaces in between? Are they governed by academic freedom or by principles and values governing the, or by principles and values governing the public sphere beyond the university? In other words, can one say more or at the same time less? And what about the smaller communities and social groupings within the university? Who decides how they should interact and communicate with each other? These are all open questions that call for deliberation and debate. When the report states that as a corollary to the university's commitment to protect and promote free expression, members of the university community must also act in conformity with the principle of free expression, it seems to suggest that the Chicago principle are not themselves open to deliberation and debate. But I hope that I have persuaded you today that they're subject to the same paradox as Kant's sapere aude namely that we truly enact them by critically interrogating and questioning them. I invite you to do so in the breakout session immediately following this address. Ask yourself how the Chicago principles apply to you as a member of our intellectual community that is the college. Do you think they should be absolute or should they have limitations? Envision some hypothetical situations or draw on the co many recent examples that have tested the standards of free inquiry expressions on campus. Not necessarily this campus, but campuses all over the US. When doing so, however, remember that the goal of these discussions is not strictly theoretical. Imagine a setting or community beyond the classroom where conversation occurs. Your house, a student organization or club you want to join, a theater production, those impassioned debates in the dining hall, or those 2 a.m. study sessions at the RAG, and discuss what principles, rules, and practices should govern these exchanges. The university is large, much larger than the classroom. Remember that class of 2027. Dare to know wherever you are and whenever you are, for liberal education is a lifelong enterprise one that starts now. Thank you.